Hey everybody, this is Vicki Davis. Not since Gutenberg's printing press in the Industrial Revolution, which allowed us to mass produce paper, has writing been as transformed as it has been uh, as we've moved online uh, using Web2 and the internet. And is in my classroom as I prepared to uh, write this book, I took all the different types of things that I do to teach writing in my classroom and started categorizing them. And I found that there are pretty much nine categories of things that, um, that you need to teach to have students prepared for this 21st century. The interesting thing is that a lot of schools are still just kind of taking the, the best practices that worked with paper and just trying to do it online. In fact, I heard the other day about a teacher who actually had the students stack the tablets on her desk and then she graded it and handed the tablets back. And that is just sad. That is not what we need to be doing as we reinvent writing. So my name is Vicki Davis. I blog at the Cool Cat Teacher blog and I'm a full-time classroom teacher. My book is Reinventing Writing. And in this book, I'll help you get started with easy ideas. I'll give you some ideas for uh, answering your most common problems. I call them yell at the screen problems or things that really frustrated me that'll save you a whole lot of time and give you a ton of classroom examples. So these are the nine tools that um, I came up with, the nine categories of um, different ways that we write in schools. And um, as you prepare and you look at what you're doing in your school, you want to take a look at all of these different ways. There are so many benefits of collaborative writing. I'm really happy to include in the book uh, a lot of research that will make you feel comfortable that helping students collaborate really does work. It helps them get more engaged with each other, with an audience, and creating feedback loops that don't require you, the teacher, to have to be the only one giving feedback. Ebooks and e-paper are two essential starting points that you need to have. Anytime your student creates a document in a word processor or anything, do they know how to print it to e-paper? Do they know how to share it with their classmates and with you? And then do you and the classmates know how to annotate and give that feedback back? Do you know how to help your students um, download and find free ebooks of all kinds? Um, do students know how to, how to do that so that they can um, have the same book that you have? You can even give links to certain locations so students can go right there from their tablet devices. So there's so many things you can do with reinventing paper, and I found that many schools haven't even started at this point. So I have found that there are five things that students really need to know how to do. Do they know how to find and download books? Do they know how to open e-paper? Can they print to e-paper no matter what document they're in? Do they know how to annotate? And can they take those notes out of their e-book or e-paper and actually put them into their notebook tools so they can be used later? So we all need a system to be able to take notes. I found that my students take a lot of pictures of the board and they can't find it later. So the question is, um, do they have the, the know-how to be able to take effective notes electronically? Now I found, first of all, that students have to be able to prepare. Um, you can't just open an electronic notebook and you're ready to go. You have to organize it. So think of this as kind of like putting your tab dividers or organizing it, like I've put my little dividers up here and got things ready to go. Uh, I have organized my notebook. And then you've got to record. Now this is an interesting thing because you can use pictures, you can use um, text, but you can also use audio and video. There's so many things that you can use. And do you are you transliterate? Do you know how to record all of those? And then do you engage with the content? Um, are you engaged in your note taking, but even later engaged with the content so you can turn that information into knowledge? Um, then do you ponder it? Do you think about it? Do you work with it? Do you talk about it with others and reflect? And finally, do you remember to sync? I mean, how many students take notes in one device and they don't sync and their notes are where, where they are? St notes should be anywhere, anytime. And I think that schools need to decide a digital notebook service that they want to use for their school. And there are a couple of good options for that. So the other thing you've got to remember is you've got all these notes that you're probably taking on your interactive whiteboard or your smart board, whatever type of device you use. And are your students getting that into their notebook? So here you can actually see uh, something that I talked about 
uh, in class and I actually took notes in my interactive whiteboard directly into the notebook. You can record in there. You can do all kinds of things. But as teachers, we should be sharing all the notes and everything we do should be captured and kind of put into one place so that our students can have advantage of that. The other thing we need to have is a way for students to be able to write together. For example, you may have a student like me or my nephews and nieces who can type over 100 words a minute. Well, I might be better and I am better off typing those notes. And then you might have somebody who might have their, their pen and they can draw on the screen and uh, do sort of a, a, a way of taking notes that way in, in, a more, in a different way or somebody who photographs or somebody who can even shoot video. So are we creating platforms and methods for our students to be able to share their notes? Remember, they're still going to have to ponder, they're still going to have to reflect and help turn those. Just having the notes is not enough. You got to get it in here and you got to understand it and you got to create with it. But just capturing the notes, if we can reduce that hurdle, especially for some of our special needs kids who may not be great note takers, but they're strong on the auditory, is going to help many more students engage with the content, learn, and capture that information. So the question is, do our students know how to take notes digitally? If they take that picture of the board, can they find it later? Are they organized and can they tag and, and can they find those things? Are they transliterate in multiple media? If they need to um, grab audio and take notes at the same time, do they know how to do that? Do they know how to organize and retrieve? Um, I think that you should, uh, after you teach something, three months later, ask them if they can find their notes on such and such and see if they can find. And let's start measuring their ability to retrieve their own notes. Uh, could you imagine having a lifelong repository of different things that you learned and notes that you had? Um, and then do they know how to capture in all the different ways? Can they get it off their phone into their notebook? If they have it on paper, do they know how to scan and pull that in their notebook? And then do they know how to share when they create a note? Can they share it with somebody? Then I teach you about how the note card has re been reinvented. If you talk to most AP Lit teachers, you're probably going to see that most of them are still creating regular old note cards. Well, there are online equivalents. They're, they're the digital note card. And so much research is online and students can't go back and find it later and they're printing off reams of paper. It's so inefficient. So students need to also understand how to take digital note cards and then how to turn them into the teacher. I mean, your students have to turn these note cards in. You don't have x-ray vision. You can't see in their backpack. Um, and you don't have x-ray vision on the internet. So there's methods for connecting your classroom and helping your students um, turn in these note cards. And then there are also all these new features that you can do that you could not do before that add some really interesting aspects to how you conduct research online. So let's say that essay writing is the only form of writing that you really want to have in your school. Okay, I can't imagine that, but let's say it is. There are enough cool features in collaborative writing tools online that will make it worth your time to pick up the book and to learn how you can harness writing communities and how you can get students uh, to give more feedback to each other. I mean, could you imagine improving writing and there's less work for the teacher? Um, now, I, I wouldn't sell this as a way to have less work for the teacher, but if you can engage those writing communities, um, it will definitely take the load off of you having to be the one proofreader in the classroom. So everybody, let's uh, just take a quick look. I mean, what usually happens? The student writes the essay, and then they might have a friend read it, but usually you know it's just that one student. Uh, they might have mom read it, but that's, that's not always the case and they give it to you, the one little teacher at the desk. I mean, it's just you, and you've got 30 of these kids, and they're all out here giving you this feedback, and you have to, and that's first draft, and then it goes back to the kid, and they revise, hopefully, but some of them will just revise what you tell them to revise. Um, what about the higher order thinking and grappling with something and changing the order and true editing that happens? And then they'll give it back to you, and then they want you to look at it, and you're so tired, you just call that final. Well, the truth is, on my blog and on books, you know, we don't have one draft. We don't have two drafts. We'll have 15 or 20 drafts. I mean, when I put my stuff up on Edutopia, before I send it to them, I edit, and I use ProWritingAid, and I use all these tools, and I'll have a good 15 or 20 edits. 
under my belt. Well, now why aren't they working together out here in a writing community in the cloud and have these four or five edits at least before you get it the first time and then you give it back and you're just part of this cloud here and then when they give it back it's already had multiple edits. So part of our problem is we're not revising enough but we have to harness the power of all these kids in the cloud here uh, in, in peer review and in a writing community so that we can have more feedback and more grappling with our topics and deep, deeper learning. So what do students need to know? They need to know how to collaborate and write together, but also individually and uh, revise and edit and give feedback. Do they know how to comment? Uh, export, import, upload, open on multiple platforms and how to share. And this is real important, especially if you want to do like a writing workshop approach and say you have one student focus on grammar and another focus on punctuation. There's all kinds of things you can do, but they need to know how to share with each other or you need to know how to set up a writing community so they can share easily. A student without a blog is a student without a voice. We also need to help our students know how to write micro blogs on things like Twitter and Edmodo so they can share tiny little snippets of what they've learned and link to sources and have conversations. So, do students know how to write first person blogs as if they were writing an editorial? Sometimes third person might be appropriate. Do they understand contextual hyperlinking? Um, do they know how to uh, pick the words that should be hyperlinked? And when are some words that they hyperlink, they could be a distraction. Do they hyperlink the same word multiple times because you don't really know, need to know how to do that? Do they know when they need to hyperlink and when they should also have it listed under their sources at the bottom? Do they know how to cite sources for videos and for other graphics that they do and how to select graphics with the kind of license they need? And then most of all, are they transliterate? Um, can they um, add other things to their blog posts that will make it more impactful? For example, graphics are read 300% uh, more than the other, uh, than the text in a uh, blog post. So do you know how to pick graphics? Again, this is something, a whole chapter on blogging and microblogging in uh, Reinventing Writing. Oh, and I love microblogging, but remember, it's not just about Twitter. You can use things like uh, fake Twitter at uh, classtools.net. There's all kinds of ways that students can use uh, microblogging, but can they write short updates? Do they know how to find conversations and again cite sources? You know, you've got uh, hat tip, you've got retweet, you've got modified tweet. This is a whole language, particularly as they get older they need to know. But even younger kids, if you follow the model of educators like Karen Learman at Learman Learns, um, you can see that she's using it with her first graders. Do they know how to give credit when they find something? And then do they know how to build their PON, particularly when they get older? So back this past fall, I realized that I had not been in my filing cabinet for three months. And it was because I have an online filing cabinet or an electronic filing cabinet. I use these different cloud syncing tools to share things with my students and to move it among all my devices and do that sort of thing. And this is really important for every teacher and every student to understand because it's really kind of the backbone of becoming paperless. Now we have one of my favorite tools, the Wiki. My friend Justin Reich from Harvard University, EdTech researcher, uh, online uh, did a massive study that he shared in the book uh, where he looked at all these wikis and he found that only a very small percentage of wikis are being used truly collaboratively. So in the book I actually have a checklist at the end that I've developed in the nine years that I've been using wikis about how to really teach students to write collaboratively. It's really hard to do um, but you have to teach a mindset. Okay, what's next and what's the next thing I need to look for? It's almost like an editing process or a checklist. Um, and, and this is one area I think education needs to improve the most. Uh, and I'm very excited about the wiki chapter in particular, just because uh, we can start a conversation about how to really use wikis to make them more collaborative in education. So students need to not only know how to write wikis, they need to know how to solve wiki wars. Troubleshooting is higher order thinking. And if you're the only one solving problems in your classroom, you're probably the only one learning. Do they know how to cite sources properly, how to embed, and how to use that discussion tab? Because the page should always be in final format and your discussion tab is where the conversation happens. 
Brainstorming is important for creativity, but it's also important life skill because you need to learn to be inclusive when you brainstorm. Sometimes the extroverted students talk and they share all these ideas and they think that they're the only creative ones because they're so loud. And they leave out those amazingly creative introverts who are very quiet. So I intentionally teach students to come up with a lot of ideas. When they brainstorm, for example, I want to have them create at least 50 ideas before they even start narrowing it down. That means they have to involve everyone and they also have to learn that no idea is a bad idea because you're just trying to generate any kind of idea you can because you have to take away that peer pressure and that desire to be cool to make it so that everyone will contribute and this is really something they need to know so they can be creative in college in the workforce and beyond just the concept of mind mapping where you connect ideas and you have an idea over here and then you have an idea over here and then you realize they connect just knowing how to do a mind map. And what will happen is if you teach students to collaboratively mind map, I tell them to look for where you have a lot of connections and a lot of ideas. So they can see here that they have a lot of things right here related to this particular topic. So this pro topic probably needs to be in their collaborative piece. So brainstorming is a form of pre-writing uh, and mind mapping that's a, a very important when you're collaboratively writing. I have found that the better pre-writing you do, the better writing you do. And it's particularly true in the case of collaborative writing. It's not just, I'm going to write this, you're going to write that. It's big picture. What are the parts that we need to understand and research so that we, you've got to turn me, you got to flip that M and turn it into we so that we write together. And brainstorming is an important part of that, both as an individual and as a group. So what do I teach here? Um, definitely mind maps, and my master is one, but there's lots of others too. Uh, all kinds of graphic organizers. I love the ones at classtools.net, but there's many, many others that help you organize things graphically. Do they know how to use a tool appropriate to the task, depending on the kind of brainstorming they're doing? And then do they also understand principles of brainstorming? For example, sometimes it's best to do it on the board and then to snap a picture and then just turn that picture into a mind map. So these are all things that students need to understand as they learn to brainstorm and pre-write and use graphic organizers. Graphics and infographics and cartoons are very important parts of writing because they can improve the comprehension of what we're writing and students need to know how to create those. I'm particularly excited about infographics and think they should be used in every single school just because infographics you can synthesize, you can summarize, you can use charts and pictures. There's such power in infographics. Of course, some of the things you'll see in the book I've written about on my blog is just the book really puts it together so that you don't have to look for things. And this is one of the world's first infographics. And it's a great example to use with kids both for a history lesson. It's Napoleon's March. And you can see here, um, you can see the dates up here, but you can see here the size of, of the uh, line is how many troops he had. And then they plot, this is the temperature, okay? So how high it is up here is the actual temperature. And you can see as the temperature drops, he ends up with less and less and, and he stops and, and people die and that sort of thing. And then you can also see where he is on the map. So there's so many things you can learn with infographics and we should really pull them into just about everything we teach, but also have students create them in websites like Easily and other sites that are good for that. So some things you want to learn. Definitely want to know about cartooning. There's lots of ways to use cartoons. I found that, uh, for example, I have my students create a cartoon explaining the difference between Web 1, Web 2, and Web 3. Uh, vo things like VoiceThread infographics and even things like Glogster and lots of other tools that you can use to kind of organize things as a graphic organizer. So I'm so excited to finally get to share this book with all of you. Um, it's been a good two years of writing. I appreciate all of the collaborative writers and everyone who was part of this. It made me think of a book uh, called Die Empty that I read recently. And it said, you know, what's the most expensive real estate in the world? Well, it's the graveyard. That's where all the books that were never written are buried and all the dreams that were never fulfilled lie. And I couldn't have my life's work um, not include a book on writing because uh, authors have changed my life. A lot of you bloggers have changed my life and I want that for students. We can do a better job. Students should be excited about writing. Um, they should have audience. They should 
experience the joy of what it means when somebody says, you know, that meant something to me. Um, a while back, I had um, one of my students get tested, and a psychologist actually wrote me a personal note. And she said, Vicki, whatever you're doing with blogging with this particular student, do it. It's the only thing he loves. It is the difference maker uh, for him because it has given him a purpose and a voice. And there's all these forms of writing, and we all need to be using it. And we don't have to sit around and imagine what the 21st century classroom looks like. A lot of us are there. A lot of you are there. And I hope this book makes it easy for all of you. I'm here on Twitter, and I do get out sometimes, so I hope you'll say hello. And here you go. Here's the book. I'm so excited.